might be a long video. I'm gonna be talking about my tummy tuck in this video, prepping for it, planning for it, the day of surgery, how my process was in the hopes that if you're watching this, you know, maybe you're planning to get a tummy tuck, maybe it's someone you know, a loved one is gonna be getting one. And this video is to make sure that like you're prepared for this because as much research as I did, like I was reading things on Reddit, reading real people's experiences and stories, there was still just a lot that I wasn't prepared for. And um, that's what this video is about. There's gonna be chapters to this video. So if you're only interested in certain things, you can just skip right along and look at the chapters and read them. Um, I've also been doing just this whole kind of series of my surgery, my pre-op appointments, how I found my doctor, the cost, um, and I've included vlogs that show in real time my experience. So buckle up, I hope you're ready, and let's get started. So the main thing I would love for you guys to take away from this, if you're considering this surgery, you're gonna be getting it, is make sure you have help. I needed help, I needed so, so much help. You are going to need help. From being able to move your body, to lifting your legs, to getting in the bed, to getting someone getting you food, to going to use the bathroom. Like you'll need help for every little thing. So make sure you have help. When it comes to your setup, your home, think about where your home is in um, comparison to the surgery place where you're getting it done. You know, how long is that drive? Are you gonna be ready and prepared for it? If you are driving, a lot of people suggest, and I actually did this too, getting a pillow so it can separate the seat belt from your body because having a seat belt put pressure not only not only I got a reduction but not only on the chest but even across your waist and your hip it's still pressure on the body so having a pillow if you're going to be making a long drive um when it comes to the car whoever's driving and picking you up like if it's too high you don't can't you won't be able to get into a big old monster truck or a big old suv you want something low to the ground that's easier for you to get into so you don't have to be using your abs having someone there who is strong enough to help lift your legs maybe carry you so you can lean on when you're walking your house think about your house setup if you live in a house that's two stories and your bedroom's on the second floor how are you going to be getting to your bedroom up and down well, you're not gonna wanna be walking up those stairs straight after surgery. Like if you live in a house that's two stories, try to put a bed or a place to stay that's gonna be on the first floor for you. These are all things to think about, you know, if you're gonna be staying in a hotel after surgery because you're flying to a different country or flying to a different state, try to get a hotel that is handicap accessible, that, you know, the beds aren't too high, that there's, that in the bathroom there's handles and things for you to hold on to because just sitting on the toilet is problematic. Standing up from the toilet is problematic. All of this stuff requires ab work and it is so incredibly painful and hard to do. I wish I had a bed, oh you can't even see me. I wish I had a bed this low for surgery, okay? You see how nice this is? If the bed was any higher, how are you gonna, you can't do that after surgery. You can't do it. Even lifting your leg to get on the bed requires abs. This position, impossible. So if you saw my vlog, you know I ended up rigging up a little setup where I'd use a rope and I tied it to a desk and I would use that to help lower myself onto the bed and to pull myself up. Before I figured that out, <laughs> I had a lot of mishaps with trying to get in and out of bed. What I would do is I'd be walking to the bed, backing up on it, kind of hold onto the wall to lower myself down, which is stressful. You're grunting the whole time. My mom would come and lift my leg and lift the other one. <laughs> and now I have to try to position myself to get comfortable. All of this requires your core and it's very, very, very uncomfortable. Some people I know use pillows and they lean back on them because you can't lay flat on your back after surgery. I use an adjustable pillow and I would a thousand, a thousand, a thousand percent recommend it. I use this adjustable pillow so I can lean back without having too much pressure on my abs. I got to sleep with it that way. And as the weeks progressed and I was supposed to be getting more of a stretch in and standing up straighter, I would use the pillow to also help promote that and to reinforce it at night so I could lower my height slowly. And when I got to the point where I'm laying flat on my back, I also use the pillow to put it under my legs to keep my legs elevated. I used it for a million different things. I would thousand percent recommend it. In my description box, check the Amazon link for all of the surgery must-haves. But day three, four, five, 
I had a moment where, oh my gosh, debilitating pain, right? So I remember my adjustable pillow and I'm leaning back on my adjustable pillow and I wanted to get up to use the restroom, right? And this is before, like I said, we had figured out my little rig situation, which was a complete lifesaver and a game changer. And if you can do that, do it. But it was this moment that made me realize I had to figure out something else. Because the whole other time I'm waiting, asking my mom to pull me up, which was just impossible. Like she just wasn't that strong, you know? But this one day I was like, okay, I need to get up. I'm gonna do it. I can sit my body up. And so I grabbed the bed, pulled it up as much as I could to try to relieve some of the tension from my core, but I used my core to pull myself up. About halfway, I realized the mistake I was making. Like it hurt so much, but I was halfway through and I was like not gonna stop. I knew if I didn't pull myself up and if I allowed myself to fall back, that I would not attempt this again and I would not be getting up. <laughs> So I gritted, and I screamed on the way up. I was sure I ripped something. I was sure I popped a stitch in my ab. I was sure I, it was terrifying and it hurt so much that by the time I actually managed to sit up, I was leaning against the wall, tears pouring down, heavy breathing. I felt nauseous. The pain was so bad that I had felt nauseous just from the amount of pain. I had to sit there, my mom runs into the room, what's going on, what's going on? And I'm just against the wall, crying, breathing, trying not to throw up because the thought of throwing up is terrifying. Like you know how your abs clench when you I was like, I cannot throw up. I can't bear any more pain to this. But that that's what this is like. Like you do not realize how much you use your abs until you get this surgery. If you saw my vlog, you know I bought a toilet seat riser. I got it from Amazon. I'll actually include in my description box my Amazon link that has a list to all my surgery must-haves. I had the toilet seat riser. Um, having the toilet seat riser made sure that I didn't have to sit too far down. You got to just, you get to, I'm standing up, I get to sit like this. I don't have to go all the way down, which takes your abs, you know? And I don't have to stand all the way back up. It just kind of helps eliminate some of that extra range of motion, which is a good thing post-surgery. A lot of people react very differently to the anesthesia. Some people, that anesthesia stays in their system for days at a time. Some people, I was able to go to the bathroom alone. And even when I showered, I was able to shower alone. But some people, they weren't able to do that you know they needed someone to help wipe them to help bathe them and you don't know what your experience is going to be like so just having someone there just in case is definitely key another thing about the anesthesia anesthesia constipates you this is one thing i was prepared for you get really backed up which can be really really uncomfortable if you're not using the restroom for days at a time and this hardness is just building in your intestines and you can feel it in your stomach which has already just been cut open it's not fun feeling bloated or hard in your belly when that area is just already so sensitive so for days before surgery i started taking laxatives stool softeners eating fruits just taking things that would make sure i'd be regular especially once i had the anesthesia which was going to clog me up so that's something to think about picking up your prescriptions you have to get your prescriptions before surgery day get them before surgery day it's totally possible to show up get your surgery not have your meds and then someone has to run to the store for you and like you don't want to do all that you want to take those medications you want to take them like clockwork right away get your prescriptions fulfilled before get all the materials and things you're going to need to make yourself comfortable get it beforehand some of the prescription meds that my doctor recommend there was one that i was supposed to take a day or two before my surgery even so get all that stuff ahead of time so i didn't do the bromelain or arnica I did some Arnica later, I did, but I didn't use it for very long. And I did the vitamin C. I didn't, did not take any collagen. If you are a dark skinned person, we are more prone to getting keloids. And that was something I was aware of. Um, I've never really keloided in my life, so I wasn't too, too stressed about it. But you never know, you know, my body has also never had this kind of incision. So, but an excess of collagen 
might cause keloids to form. So if you are a brown skin person who is prone to keloids, you might want to make sure you're not taking collagen or make sure some of the foods or things you're eating, if you do take any supplements, don't have collagen in them. A lot of beauty products do have collagen to promote like firmness of skin and that kind of stuff. So that might be something you might want to just monitor right before your surgery. You also want to plan your protein out. Protein is so important during this process, during this stage. Plan out how you're going to be getting in your 100 grams because you're not going to be able to just eat chicken and turkey and you won't be able to eat. <laughs> I was not able to eat for the first like two days really and I finally started adding solids in day three. So how are you going to get your protein in? Do you have everything you need? I bought those Premier Protein Shakes and I was having like one to two a day for the first month after my surgery like i stocked up on those things and they were a lifesaver my doctor had me taking vitamin c which also promotes healing two weeks prior to surgery i know some people also take arnica which i did get arnica but i haven't really noticed it doing too much but some people do take arnica before and during and after their surgery and bromelain things that help your body reduce swelling and, and promote healing and reduce bru and reduces bruising and all that kind of stuff but you want to get these things before if you're a smoker you want to stop smoking i don't smoke but i do like to drink every once in a while i did not drink for two weeks prior to surgery and that was only because like I think I, I think my doctor had recommended to don't drink any alcohol I think it was just like a few days before surgery but I just didn't drink at all completely because I know myself if anything goes wrong with the surgery if there's a single complication I know I'll end up thinking it's because I drank this alcohol or it's because I, I did something outside of my norm that I know wasn't the best thing for my health so Take into account these things. You will have to limit them leading up to your surgery. You don't have to do two weeks like I did, but you will have to limit them. If you're a smoker, you will need to stop smoking. I think it's recommended six weeks prior to surgery, but it's probably better to, to stop it before then. I know smoking is like highly addictive and it doesn't matter what you smoke, whether it's weed or cigarettes or you vape, you'll need to stop that stuff because smoking really can compromise your cardiovascular system. It will weaken it, messes up your lungs, and you don't want anything that's gonna be compromising your health. Anything that's gonna slow down the body systems for healing. You don't wanna constrict your blood flow. You want your blood to flow, your lungs to work. You want your body to be in the most optimal position to heal itself. And so, so these are things you need to think about and, and prep and plan for with surgery. Um, I read stories of people who managed to stop smoking a few weeks before surgery, but because it was only a few weeks before surgery, they found themselves like post-surgery really craving like a cigarette and they would smoke post-surgery. Your body is still trying to heal then. Like you wanna clean your system before the surgery, but also during the surgery period. So you know yourself, you know what you need to do. Talk to your doctor also if you are diabetic or significantly overweight. These are things that might add extra complications and risk to your surgery and your healing. So talk to your doctor about that because this surgery is serious and healing is important like google necrosis i've been seeing enough stories and pictures of necrosis in regards to this surgery it scared me for life sometimes the body just refuses to heal sometimes it you know certain parts of fat and things die off and it just rejects things and it'll just complicate this surgery and make a recovery process that hopefully should be six to eight weeks it'll make it even longer so talking about things to do before surgery weight loss i did want to touch on this because i know i mean i've been this is a weight loss channel i lost weight which is why i finally got my surgeries but i still have more weight to lose and people i have ha seen comments of people asking me about weight loss post-surgery or maybe shouldn't i have lost more you know before getting the surgery i got the surgery too early things like that no doctor that i spoke to during all my consultations mentioned anything about my weight my bmi nothing they saw me they looked at me i was good to go it was never a question in fact i know i've titled some of my videos like plus size tummy tuck because i still feel plus size <laughs> but in no way did my doctors categorize this as a plus size tummy tuck they didn't say okay you're getting a tummy tuck as a plus size individual or overweight person they didn't say anything about my bmi my weight it just wasn't a factor and i was more concerned with my weight and making sure i was a good enough size and had 
lost enough abdominal fat to get these surgeries because tummy tuck as i said before is not a weight loss surgery it's to remove loose sagging hanging wrinkly skin that's what it's done that, that's what it removes it's not to remove fat from your body and i had results that i had wanted to achieve and luckily my doctor like we did achieve them like he was right you know i did have a flat tummy he removed this skin i still have more fat to lose and i've been assured and i've also seen stories of people who've lost weight post tummy tuck i probably want to lose 20 to maybe 30 pounds who knows and that should not be a problem i've seen pictures of women who've lost 30 plus pounds after their tummy tuck and their results just got better and my doctor assured me that would be the case as well as far as those of you guys asking if i plan to get any other surgeries i don't um or why didn't i get a 360 tummy tuck um i never even really asked about that the only thing i've been wanting to change is getting a little bit of a reduction in my belly that apron belly was just the bane of my existence <laughs> and i haven't really had problems with anything else it, and also I mean I still have more fat to lose if I was going to do the 360 I probably would have like okay let me lose more fat because I have a lot of fat on my back still like my doctor said it you guys noticed in the vlog I was like I could see it <laughs> and so my body was not ready for a 360 tummy tuck but it's also something I wasn't even really looking into I just wanted the reduction and the boobies of course I can I mean I've been overweight like my entire life literally and my weight has yo-yoed and so like I'm hoping when I lose, of course, my arms shrink, my thighs shrink, and I, I think I do have loose skin in those areas, but it doesn't bug me enough to where I think I, I want to get surgery. I am not planning to get another surgery again. This is it, one and done, and yeah, the rest of it I'm not too worried about. I don't really care if I have a little loose skin on my thighs or loose skin on my back. Like I don't really care about it, but we'll see how it goes. I will be documenting the rest of this journey. I'll definitely have a video, you know, after I've lost the weight, like, how did my tummy tuck hold up? You know, tummy tuck after weight loss. So expect that to come. Plan to take time off of work. Everyone's job is different. The physical demands are going to be different. You'll know what's good for you, but I would suggest taking three weeks off if that's possible. Um, around week two, I started getting a lot more energy thinking I was more capable and my body was like, hold up, nah. And that was incredibly frustrating for me. Around week two is when I had a client reach out to me about taking on a job. And for those of you who don't know, I work online. I work from my laptop. And so I'm like, I'm in recovery, on my computer, watching TV every day. I could take a job. I'm, you know, I'm just sitting there on a computer anyway. Like, who cares? I'm not gonna be getting up and being active. I struggled to do that job. I tried to jump into work sooner than I was actually able to. And was I physically capable? Yes. Did I finish the job? Yes. Was it turned in late? Yes. Because even though I, it wasn't a physically demanding task, it was still just energy and my body was exhausted. Your body focuses so much on your healing. You're burning extra calories during this time because you're healing. It takes energy to heal. I can't imagine, you know, trying to go back to a physical job where I'm moving or in an office and walking around two weeks post-op. So I'd recommend take three, but you know, do what you gotta do. If you do have an office job or a job that's you know intensive and requires a lot of movement or activity plan for that activity and movement post-surgery causes swelling you're already going to be swelling like we've had such major trauma done to the body via this surgery you're going to be swelling it's an inevitability um and speaking of swelling swelling travels it travels it travels <laughs> i've read so many stories of people being like whoa why are my thighs swollen why why is my vulva swollen or even men like their junk can turn purple like because of the swelling and the blood um i don't think i swelled anywhere else other than my torso maybe a little bit on one of my thighs because i had some weird pain i remember during one week and i thought maybe i'm just swelling i don't know but swelling is a thing you will have to deal with it and the more active you start to get the more your body swells um we can talk about compression garments because they you are instructed to wear compression garments i did wear compression i was given a binder to wear from my doctor and i think i wore that for the first maybe three weeks to a month and then he told me to switch out and just do Spanx um i don't think my doctor i mean i can't speak for him but just based on my instructions 
I don't know if he's a super, super fan of crazy compression. I know it's very popular to wear like fajas or fajas. I don't know how to pronounce them. That was never recommended to me. My doctor sent me home with the binder. I was supposed to stay in it, use it 24 seven. I did. And then maybe around week three, week four, he just told me, okay, yeah, just wear normal Spanx. I bought the Spanx. I preferred the binder. <laughs> the binder had even more compression than the Spanx. And then taking off the binder, right after surgery, you spend so much time in compression garments that when you start removing them, your body has to kind of regulate. So you start swelling even more. And so when I was trying to move to the Spanx, I just, I just love the security and the comfort of the binder. But I trusted my doctor and I knew that he had recommended I switch it off for a reason. So I did start just limiting it. Um, but to this day, I still have the binder and I still use it because I've started slowly working out, which you guys will see. We have a workout video coming next. But I started slowly working out and yeah, my swelling just goes off the handles. And so it's just nice to use the compression at times. But yeah, my doctor never recommended a faja. I know I've gotten a lot of questions about that and that was just never anything yet. <laughs> I might look into one myself because I still enjoy the compression. So the day of surgery, I was supposed to arrive at the surgery center um, at 6.30 in the morning. And I think my surgery was scheduled for around 7.30 or eight or nine, some, somewhere around there. I don't even really remember. Like, as you can imagine, I'm like, being driven, my mom drove me to the surgery center, just a ball of nerves. I've never been under anesthesia before. I've never had surgery before. And this was gonna be a first for me. So I was really, really scared. But once I got to the surgery center, everyone was just cool, calm and collected. Like they do this every day. This is their job, right? So we signed in, met with the nurses, um, a tech, the anesthesiologist and of course my doctor. I had conversations with all of, with all of these people, them telling me what their job is, you know, just reassuring me. I was allowed to ask questions. I think they did a really good job of just like helping me kind of calm my nerves for surgery. The anesthesiologist even gave me her number, which I don't I don't remember why she did that, <laughs> but she gave me her number and even sent me a text message. And um, speaking to my doctor the day of surgery is when he marked me up. This is the first time I had gotten marked up. I had st stood in front of the man naked before, but the day of, it was really nothing like it. It's so weird. I am not an exhibitionist. I am not a nudist. So just kind of standing there, it's a super vulnerable moment, especially because I mean, everyone knows you're there get, to get surgery, to get something removed or taken away or whatever that is already a huge insecurity of yours. So it's just all out there in the buff. It's so funny because they act, they're so unfazed. But like I said, this is their everyday job. They do this all the time. I'm sure they see naked people all the time. But I was definitely, it was a vulnerable moment for me. So I was so happy just to have my mom there. Um, Cause he's like marking me up, right? Drawing down lines down my chest, around the nipples, everything on my belly, telling me this is where the incisions are gonna be. Um, and that took a good, I don't know, five to 10 minutes, just like him explaining and walking through what was gonna happen. I also got to ask like last minute questions during this time. But yeah, after talking with him, I had to shower myself the morning of surgery. I was instructed to shower the night before and the morning of with this antiseptic bacterial soap that the doctor had recommended. That's all you're supposed to use. No lotions, no oils, no nothing, no makeup, just go completely bare. Um, and so they did not shower me while I was in the surgery center. I know every doctor has different procedures. I've heard stories where people are getting bathed by the nurses, the, the like moments before their surgery. So check with your doctor about what's gonna be happening to you. But I was told to shower the night before in the morning of when I woke up and they did not wash me down or anything like that. Uh, I also ended up talking to one of the nurse techs that was there. The next thing you know, they had me put my cell phone and things away, put me in this little gown, and they're walking me to the surgery center, to the room. I got to say bye to my mom, who she was in the waiting room. Yeah, nerves are kicking in. I'm constantly like, breathe, just breathe, stay calm, you're gonna be fine. Like, I was a ball of nerves. Uh, we walk into this room, and it was a really big room. I don't know if they did the surgery there, but I got knocked out in that room. <laughs> but it was a really big room. I feel like there was multiple beds in there. Um, but they take me to my like surgery table bed and it's like it's like a table but it's like room for your arms so you have to lay out like this it's kind of like a crucifix like you're walking 
to the crucifix and you lay down plop down put your arms out where they tell you and the anesthesiologist and the nurse was there and they were just making conversation with me i remember the anesthesiologist telling me that she was going to insert like a muscle relaxant and so i'm thinking okay she's going to do the muscle relaxant and then they're going to tell me when they do the gas or whatever the anesthesia i don't i don't even know but she tells me she's doing the muscle relaxant all I remember, my very last thought, was I was looking up at the ceiling on my little cross. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is crazy. Am I really about to get surgery? Like, is this really about to happen? Boom, lights out. That's the very last thought I had. Like, that's the only thing I remember. Next thing you know, I'm waking up, groggy, waking up. The nurse is next to me. She's like, hi, Ashley, hi, how are you? How are you feeling? Da, da, da. And I just remember being like, wait, is over and she's like yeah you're all done it's done and i just i just thought like oh my god so like i'm alive i woke up i <laughs> i'm alive i'm here praise god because i was really like paranoid about just not waking up because i'd never been under anesthesia but it was the coolest thing ever it's literally like you go out lights out and then you're up the next second and everything is done i was under for seven to eight hours yeah it was intense i was under what the, my doctor said was like basically the max amount of time for them to do everything they needed to do as if you've seen my other videos you know it's because my breast, my breast reduction was said to be very complicated that's kind of what took the most time in fact my mom told me that the doctor called her after the reduction and telling her, okay, we're gonna start the tummy tuck portion now. And apparently the reduction took five hours. She said, they called me at this time and they said, okay, we finished her reduction. Now we're getting to the tummy tuck. So the reduction took about five-ish hours on its own. And the tummy tuck was like three, two and a half, two to three, since it was seven to eight hours. So I just remember like, oh my God, I'm up. And then I remember the nurses calling my mom to tell her she could come pick me up. And then I knocked out again. I was just in and out of it, falling in and out of sleep for a while until my mom was actually there. And then the nurses kind of, um, I don't know how I got from the bed to the wheelchair. I don't know, but I know I was in a wheelchair. And I remember the nurses kind of walking us through what the next few days would look like, telling us about my medication, how I should be taking it, da, 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 and giving us rules and all kind of stuff. And this is when I was like, well, I wanna, I know I'm not gonna remember this. I was so groggy. So that's when I turned on my camera to record the nurse so I could replay it if I needed to. And yeah, I recorded her talking, giving us instructions for about 15 minutes. And then they're like willing me out to the car because we're about to go home. Um, they get, I had all my medication, right? but I wasn't instructed to take it until like I got home or if it's a long drive on the way home, which is what I did. I ended up popping my first pill on the way home because they take care of you while you're in the surgery center. So I think they had me on morphine or something. I feel like I noticed my hips and my breasts. I do feel like I noticed a burning sensation where the cuts were. Um, I think the meds they gave me when I went home must have been stronger than what they, what they left me with. Or maybe it's because the surgery was so fresh. I really don't know. Getting from my wheelchair into the car was the first time I realized how difficult this surgery was gonna be. A lot of people showed up for me. Like I said, my mom was there. My brother showed up when it was time for me to go. His wife, my cousin, they all had to like help me get from my wheelchair into the car. It's the most complicated thing. You don't recognize how much you use your abs until you get a tummy tuck and you gotta use your abs. And that's also especially because I got the tummy tuck, which is cut from hip to hip, but I also did get muscle repair. I didn't think I would need abdominal muscle repair, but apparently even if you've never been pregnant, that might be something that you need. I was really, I remember during my first consults with all the doctors, I was saying, I don't want muscle repair. I don't want that. And it wasn't until like talking to the doctor I chose, he was really uh, curious, like, well, why? And I told him, I'm very active. I heard the muscle repair makes the recovery, it's the hardest part of recovery. And it takes the longest to heal. The abdominal repair is just intense, so I did not want it. But my doctor told me like, well, it might be best if you get it. Your results won't be as good if you don't get it. And I'm like, I've never had kids. Like, why would I need this? Like. But he says, even if you were just overweight, if you had gained weight, if you have internal visceral fat, that's fat that's in between 
muscles and organs and things and it can actually cause the separation it might not be the same level of separation as a woman who gets pregnant and a baby stretches out the belly and everything right but being overweight does can do that it can separate and push your muscles out and stuff and so once he told me that you know i was just kind of like okay well i mean i'm paying this much money i don't want to get this surgery and be unsatisfied so i told him you know what if you're in there and i need it do what you gotta do but if not don't worry about it <laughs> but yeah he did do the muscle repair and um so anyway i'm getting from the wheelchair to the car standing up is a problem use your abs use your core to stand up you know i had my arms around like someone's neck and trying to lean back into the car lowering down to lean back into the car when you try to go slow and control to lower yourself you're using your abs i feel like the whole time i'm trying to sit down stand up and then sit back down i was just kind of like uh, like screaming <laughs> like like just moaning through it because it was so painful and i'm the type of person that and this is kind of my problem there were so many moments where i thought i could do it i could do it i'm fine and i was humbled i struggle with asking for help i don't like being a burden i'm very independent also like just because of how active i am i'm like i'm strong i could lift weight i could do this i could do that but surgery renders you utterly helpless and it was hard on multiple levels, you know, feeling guilty that so many people have to help me out that I can't do the most basic things to feeling frustrated because I couldn't do these things. Going from the wheelchair into the car was just the first moment that I was like, this is gonna be rough. Like on the car ride home, I'm like on the verge of tears cause it's just painful and I just don't know what I'm in for basically. Um, and like I said, so like my mom was the main one there to help me, she's a nurse, but she's older. As much as she was there like to help assist me in every single thing, when it came to having to move my body, it was just like, my mom can't lift me up. She can't carry me. Like even lifting a single leg of mine onto the bed was like heavy for her. She's a small woman, you know? And so like on the drive to the Airbnb, I'm like, who's gonna help me get out the car? If my mom tries to help me, my weight alone, she might buckle under my weight. She might fall. Like, I called my dad on the way home, you know, my virgin tears. Daddy, can you meet us at the Airbnb? I, I need help getting out the car. Because I, I, getting into the car was such a feat. And I just knew this was going to be a problem. And so, yeah, my dad agreed to meet us. He met us at the Airbnb. He helped me get out of the car, walk to the Airbnb and get into the bed, all of which were just impossible. You don't know the pain, <laughs> like your abs. I literally, let me show you guys. I'm like, you're, you're hunched over the whole time and holding on to someone trying to walk, walking like this, this slow, like the babiest babies of steps, okay? Getting into the bed, you have to lift your legs. You can't do that. You can't lift your legs right after you just got surgery. It was impossible. It's like, okay, well, the best thing to do is try to sit down on the bed. Even that, it's so painful. You, you're using your abs to make sure you're staying in control. Once you're sitting in the bed, how are you gonna lift your legs up onto the bed? How are you gonna position yourself and scoot back onto the bed? All of these things require your abs. And this is why this recovery was so, so hard and why I wanted to make this video so you feel prepared when you're going through it. I did not know what to expect. I had been reading stories for so long, so I knew some stuff, I had tips and advice, but you just don't know what it's like until you're in it. And maybe unless you've you know, been pregnant and you've had a C-section and stuff like that and you've had similar surgeries, but I had never had surgery before in my life. I've never been pregnant, never had a C-section, nothing. And this was just, it truly humbled me. I had to rely so much on other people, which was hard for me already, but it was crazy how utterly helpless I was and how I felt. And you know, these are things that you need to think about because getting into and out of the car if you come in in a huge monster truck or a, a big SUV, you're not gonna be able to get into your car. How are you gonna lift yourself up into the car or even get out into the car if it's a major step, you know? You're the bed you have at home or if you're gonna be staying in a hotel, if it's a high bed and it's off the floor, you're not gonna be able to get into your bed, you know? I had an Airbnb, the bed was lower so I could kinda lean, 
but it's still so, so, so impossible. You will need someone there to help you. And I needed someone there to help me. I know via like my doctor's like orders, they had recommended, oh, have someone to help you at least for the first 24 hours. That's insane. I'm telling you now, you will need someone to help you for at least a minimum of four to five days. I really had my mom who was there taking care of me, babysitting me, nursing me for the first five days and it was more than necessary because once we finally got to the Airbnb, once my dad, because I needed someone strong to really help me because my mom was there, God bless her, but there's only so much she can do. Getting me out of the car, walking me to you know the doors, getting into the bedroom, all of it was a huge feat, even for him to help me do that. And then those next couple days, <laughs> the days have kind of blurred together because I blacked out. I don't remember everything because I blacked out. The anesthesia does a number on you. The medicine you're taking does a number on you. And you will need someone there for the first few days to make sure you're taking the meds and things on time, to feed you, to help you walk up and down to the bathroom, to help you move because you do still have to move. Like it's so tempting during this time to just, I'ma just stay in bed for three days straight. Like it's so tempting to wanna do that, but you have to move your body every few hours so you don't develop blood clots. Like right after surgery, I think it's the first two weeks you're at a higher risk for getting blood clots. So you still have to move and it's like the last thing you want to do, but it's something you have to do. And so you're going to need someone for that. You know, if you have kids at home, think about how is that going to work? You won't be, if you have babies, you won't be able to pick them up. You won't be able to play with the toddlers. If you have pets, you have a dog that wants to jump on you that doesn't understand you just had surgery or a cat that lays on top of you and doesn't understand you will not be able to take care of those animals or have them around you when you're in and out of it, when their dander gets in the way. And like, I can't imagine having a cat or a dog, not only having to worry about having to feed myself, which is impossible. <laughs> like the first few days I couldn't even eat, <laughs> but to take care of them, to monitor them, having them wanted to cuddle with me, even their fur making me sneeze, you can't sneeze after surgery. It is so painful. I had a bag full of cough drops because that's, if I felt a tickle in my throat, I was like, nah, we're not cough drops because <laughs> I'm not experiencing that pain again. Every, ugh, anything that you do with your abs, I can't express to you how much pain it is, all right? Coughing uses your abs. Sneezing using your, uses your abs. Laughing uses your abs. You live with a, a husband or a roommate or someone that's funny, they can, you don't want them telling you jokes during surgery because laughing is painful, okay? Clearing your throat, which after surgery, after you have the incubation tube down your throat for hours at a time, your throat might be sore, you might have phlegm, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be feeling the desire to go <coughs> just to clear your throat and you'll do it but it's painful to do it. Like it is no joke, it's so, so serious. And I was not fully prepared for it. All of this stuff, the pain that you experience, trying to do the simplest things, trying to suppress your coughs, your laughter, your sneezes, all of this, you will be like this for days, four days groggy in and out of it not completely lucid like i needed someone there to help feed me to remind me to use a bed restroom to remind me to do my little walks to avoid blood clots and stuff for days all of this stuff kind of blurred together i was like in and out of it the only times i really woke up and this is actually crazy and i feel like this is how intense the pain kind of is because once i started taking my meds and the muscle relaxers I didn't really notice too much. It was like, oh, they did their job. But I would wake up out of my sleep when it was time to take them again. It was like the pain was waking my body up. I'd wake up and be like, what time is it? Oh, I don't feel so good. Oh, it's time to take the pills. Okay, take the pills, <sighs> knocked out again. That's how it was for me for the first maybe three days. I think I watched my first TV show on day three and even then I couldn't stay awake. I think I was watching Sex in the City. <laughs> And I put it on because I was like feeling a bit more lucid, feeling a bit more, put it on, fell asleep halfway through. Like sleeping on and off for the first three days, having my mom there was a godsend. She brought me every meal. And like I said, I wasn't able to eat. For the first three days, all I did was soup. Soup 
and I started throwing in crackers because my mom's like, you gotta get crackers, you gotta get some solids in. So I'm taking crackers when I can, trying to get my fluids, drinking Pedialyte, drinking water, um, and also drinking protein shakes. Getting in your protein during this time is so important. You're supposed to be getting 100 grams in a day. That's what I was recommended, and I think it's what's commonly recommended as like a minimum, just to help further promote healing. But it's really hard to get protein in when you can't really eat and you don't have an appetite, you know? Um, so those premiered protein shakes definitely saved my life because I was on a full liquid diet for about three days and then slowly started adding in solids. So think about this, plan for this, get all of the things that you need before surgery get it before your surgery, including your medication. Because if you think, oh, I'm gonna get surgery, then I'm gonna run to the pharmacy and get, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna be out of it. You are not gonna be lucid. You're not gonna wanna move. You might not even be able to move. Like, I'm telling you, it was intense. So the first week, first three days, complete blur, in and out of it, eating when I got woken up to eat, doing little walks and shuffles around when I can, but mostly I just spent the entire time sleeping. Um, I will say by day five, I was feeling a bit more like, a bit more like myself and definitely more aware. Um, and I was like staying up for longer periods of time. I did not look at myself, touch myself. I didn't, I didn't do anything for the first week um, and I wasn't even tempted to I know you get surgery and maybe you're so excited you want to see oh let me see let me see I was just so focused on healing and so out of it I and I also wasn't eager to get a look at myself in the beginning because I mean I'm cut up I know I look like Frankenstein I know my body's probably bruised and black and brown the last thing I want to do is look in the mirror and then find something to focus on and say wait should it look like that and then I start going down a spiral full of anxiety so like i'm already in so much physical pain i didn't want to add any emotional turmoil to that so i did not get a first look at myself until day seven which is the first time i showered um i put i put off my showers i mm -mm. Mm -mm. I mean, I'm spending the whole I'm spending the whole time sleeping anyway. I did use wet wipes just to stay clean and stay a little fresh, but I did not shower until maybe day seven, day eight, and then I had my first post-op appointment then too, and that was my motivator. I was like, I don't want to show up at my first post-op appointment funky, so I did shower right before my first post-op appointment. And I do want to warn you: a lot of people talk about their first shower and how they almost faint. So have someone with you when you do your first shower. I didn't have anyone with me. At this point, my mom had left. I'm at my dad's house and yeah. So I didn't have anyone with me, but I was aware of the fainting and I brought like a little chair so I could sit in. I would highly recommend something to sit in when you're in the shower, whether you have like a stool, a wooden, you know, or a shower chair, because standing the whole time to shower is just not gonna happen. First of all, you aren't standing straight. It took me five and a half weeks to really be standing straight. And I would say maybe around week two or three when I was kind of, actually around week two, when I was more straight where it wasn't incredibly painful. But the first couple days, the first week of, you know, after surgery, you're like this. You're walking like this. It creates so much strain and pressure on your back. It's so uncomfortable. It's so painful. You're not going to be standing in the shower hunched over like this for very long. Get yourself a shower chair, somewhere to sit so you can take your time and just have the shower head rinse your body. <laughs> which it did feel really nice to finally shower and it was the first time I saw myself naked too I like set up my phone so I could just look at myself and that was just like a crazy moment like I couldn't get over my flat tummy like my breasts still had a bunch of tape on them so like I was looking at the size of them like oh my god they're so small and perky you know but my tummy was like wow like she is just Flat. like I've never in my life seen my stomach like this it was definitely just a very excited moment I already started picturing everything I could wear all the little crop tops I I've been purchasing crop tops and dresses that have been too small for years like I plan to go shopping I mean I still want to lose more weight too so like I'm still gonna have to do shopping but I already got some clothes to wear because I purchased it for so long <laughs> thinking I would wear them and not feeling comfortable in it so i already got, this is one of them i purchased this i don't even know when 
You can see how oversized it is. This Dragon Ball Z crop top. So I already, I already got some clothes to wear. <laughs> but yeah, seeing myself naked was just a very surreal moment. Speaking on or touching on the hunch and the back pain, ew, that first week, my back screaming bloody murder. It hurt so much. I considered getting a walker and a lot of people do get walkers. If your doctor recommends it, go for it, you know? Um, my doctor did not want me to get a walker. I specifically asked him about it. and He didn't want to give me a walker, so I did not get a walker. Although by day two, I remember being like, cause you have to get up, people wake you up so you could do your little walk to make sure you don't get any blood clots, right? And I remember by day two just being like, I need to buy a walker. <laughs> cause the back pain is just unlike anything I've ever experienced. Cause you're so hunched over, it hurts so much. I didn't do it cause I listened to my doctor and I his reasoning for his patients not getting a walker. If I remember correctly, so don't quote me, was that if you use a walker, you know, it relieves the back pain. It relieves, you know, the extra weight that your back is holding on to. So it does make it easier to get around, but also you can start relying on it. And the goal is for you to eventually stand up straight. You're hunched over because of the work that they did, right? The tightness, but your skin has to kind of stretch and the elasticity so you can finally stand up straight. And if you use a walker, you're gonna just be relying on it. You're more likely to continue to stay hunched over for longer than you need to be simply because you're relying on the walker for so much. If you don't have the walker, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's painful, your back hurts, but you're also eager to get upright. <laughs> you don't wanna to be too eager, you don't wanna rip or tear anything, right? You just have to let the body do, do what it does. But if you're relying on the walker and you stay hunched over and you're just always hunched over because you're always on the walker then yeah you're just not giving your body the time and the space to like standing up and getting that stretch in that you should be getting basically I, if i remember correctly it was just him thinking that using a walker might prolong you being hunched over for longer than it needs to simply because you're not even tempted to try to stand up straighter you get me um i did have drains with my surgery i had two drains two one coming out of my right side my left side and then for my hip two coming out my pubic mound um the drains weren't bad for me i only had them in until day 10. the purpose of the drains is to remove excess fluid that you that, that is built up in the body like post-surgery because your body just went under major trauma being cut and sliced open and all that jazz so the drains help remove excess fluid to prevent seromas and just that kind of buildup. So when you get your drains removed, it's really gonna depend on how much output the drains have, right? So the drains, they do, they have markings and every day um, in the morning and at night, you have to mark how much output, like gunk and fluid and blood and it's even like fat and a bunch of nasty stuff inside the drains, how much it actually produced. You mark it, in the morning and at night and you have to empty it at morning and at night and you do this every day until your body is producing but as small of amount that it needs to for him to feel comfortable that okay you can take the drains out for me that was day 10 for a lot of people that takes two weeks three weeks even and a lot of them have really really unpleasant experiences with the drain just the irritability of it how uncomfortable it is and then not to mention at least for myself when i'm wearing the drains i was wearing a gown like I was not wearing normal clothes. I don't know how I would have fit normal clothes around the drains. Although I'm sure it's possible because some people have their drains in still by week three and they start going back to work. So I'm sure there's a way you can do it. But yeah, I wore these dressing gowns every day until my drains were out. And so getting the drains out was really <laughs> nice because I was finally able to put on normal clothes and it just feels a bit more normal. Um, I did go to my doctor's appointment and he took the drains out himself. It wasn't painful at all. He, it's a bit alarming because I mean, you're already kind of anxious. Like you just had surgery, you've been sliced open and now your doctor's gonna be pulling this tube out from your body. So it's a little anxious, but it wasn't painful. Like I just remember, telling myself to be calm. He pulls it and it's like startling, but it wasn't painful. Um, but yeah, he removed the drains day 10 and things just got exponentially better after that. The drains didn't bug me. The last day or two, they started to bug me, but they didn't bug me too much, but it was just so nice wearing normal clothes, being able to put on a top that you know I had worn before and I could really see how different it fits me now being able to put on pants and also at this point it's like you know what maybe I could go somewhere because I could wear normal clothes now so 
it was really really uphill after getting the drains removed so the next few weeks of my recovery i've made some vlogs showing my experiences week one through seven i'm currently about you know two months post-op so i still have a ways to go i'm very very happy i did the surgery even with recovery being this rough like i'm very happy with my results i'm so excited to see just how things are going to be in the future um, apparently you don't even really get to see your final results until about six months to one year like that's how long it takes for your body to kind of calm down for the swelling to subside for you to start really seeing everything come together so i'm already really incredibly happy with how i look now and i know it's only going to get better from here especially with more weight loss i think this is everything i have for you guys showcasing my experience the day of and really just highlighting what i think are the most important things to prepping and planning for this surgery i hope to have given you just like a very raw unfiltered view of kind of what to expect because i didn't see a breakdown like this really in all of my research of course i heard a lot of personal stories but to have something that's all in one has everything i just hope you find this helpful if you did please give it a thumbs up make sure you're subscribed and yeah that's gonna be pretty much it for this video i'm very happy with my results and my recovery so far haven't had any complications praise god and i'm excited to continue going forward and just getting back into my weight loss into normal life and um losing the last of this weight and seeing how my tummy tuck holds up so yes i'm very happy i did this surgery it was rough it really was but it was more than worth it honestly day seven when i first saw myself naked this is worth it <laughs> like definitely worth it um and i totally recommend my doctor i think he did a great job he listened to me he was communicative he was there you know i saw him every appointment every appointment that i had every post appointment it was always him and i know that's not always the case sometimes with doctors maybe they're so busy you only get to see the nurse but it's just so reassuring and being able to talk to the surgeon who did my surgery you know so i would totally recommend him i use farbod is million um in california i think he's actually in orange county but yeah that was my doctor this was my experience and i hope you guys enjoyed it i will see you sunday for the next video bye